Welcome to the Earth Feels Podcast. I'm Rose. And I'm Christine. Welcome to Earth Feels, the podcast for people feeling overwhelmed by the endlessly gloomy climate news. Where every week we have soul-based conversations about climate change and explore the idea that climate change may be happening for us as much as it is happening to us. If you are ready to shift your focus and secure the future for our kids and our grandkids, then this is the podcast for you. And yes, we do know how to spell. (laughs) Hi, Rose. Hey, Christine. What's our question today? Our question today is, what are the best clean energy alternatives? That's a good question. And we're drawing from Project Drawdown for this discussion, right? From Drawdown, the most comprehensive plan ever proposed to reverse global warming. So the book. Yes, we haven't talked about it in a while. No, we haven't. And um, what I love about it is that these are all, well, there's a hundred current technologies, current alternatives, current solutions. Solutions, yes. Yeah, current solutions um, that are already in existence to bring our carbon, uh, our CO2 level back to 350, right? Or or below. Or below. Yeah, yeah. We're we're up at a pretty scary high number. Have you seen it? Have you seen where it is recently? I don't know. Is it 417 parts per million? I've seen that. That was the last, that was the last one I saw, but that was several months ago. So I don't know where we are now. Well, I know that in the winter it's lower. Starts to climb. I didn't know if, um, how much the Australian bushfires would have added to that. I read somewhere that it was that, that the, it was the, like the equivalent of a Hiroshima bomb going off every day for X amount of time or something like that. Um, so I, I don't know if it's higher or not. I'll have, we'll have to look at that and, and, and provide that in the link too. All right. I follow, I think it's Mauna Loa observatory in Hawaii. I follow them on Instagram and they post it every day. Oh, they do. Okay. I have to say, it's a little disheartening. Are Are you looking at it right now? I am. Oh God, what is it? Oh, there we are. CO two Earth. It was posted eight hours ago. Interesting, and again, because it's slightly lower in winter, it tends to be the highest I think in May. So I don't want us to be too excited about this but it's it's actually 415 which of course is horrific but a week ago it was 413 a year ago in 2019 it was 411 and 10 years ago in 2010 it was 389.37 parts per million okay so So it's gonna so it's gonna vacillate a little bit um day to day and especially seasonally yeah but the trend is still heading upwards. Does, does it graph it? Does it show it on a graph that you can see that it's going on? Uh, it, it probably does on the website. Oh, there okay. it is. There it is. Yes. Follow them on Instagram, folks. It is co2.earth if you want the latest parts per million of carbon dioxide. And maybe you don't want to know maybe. if you don't want to know. I mean, just don't look at it yeah. every day. Don't look at it. Yeah, look at it every once in a while. Otherwise, That's- you'll be... Let's just say it's bad. Mm. That's why we're here talking about this. Yeah. yeah. Instead of, I don't know, what would we be doing otherwise? <laughs> Going out in the town. Uh, yeah. Watching the Iowa caucuses here today. Oh, right. is that, does that end today? I think it does end today. It's very complicated, but mm. very, very interesting process. They did it in Washington state and I had an opportunity back in 2008 um, but I digress. I mean, it's off subject. It was int- it's very interesting how it, it all comes together. And complicated, kind of like your electoral system in general. 
long exactly. and drawn out. Exactly. And ultimately what it leads to is the number of delegates that are going to go from that state and who they're going to represent that go so, to that go to the democratic national convention hmm. and that's where yeah okay well so that's the fun thing that you would be doing if we weren't <laughs> so aren't you lucky that here we are yep. chatting and chatting about energy so i think one of the interesting things about project drawdowns list of the top 100 or even if you look at the top 10 or 20 is that mm -hmm. yes energy is in there as solutions like offshore wind and solar mm -hmm. projects but that's just three i think there's three energy solutions in the top 20 and the mm -hmm. other two i mean we've already talked about food once right. there's right. a couple of different food solutions in the top solutions involving um, women and girls right are also in that that top 10 i think so yes. so interesting because a lot of people i think myself included when they think about climate solutions they go well yes we all have to drive electric cars and put solar panels on our roof but that is not what project drawdown tells us right no it talks about all the different solutions that that are available to us um and like you like you touched on a lot of them a lot of them revolve around our food regenerative practices um organic farming yeah this is a test do you remember what the number one was refrigeration <gasps> very good you just passed it Thank yeah you. but who would but who would think that refrigeration is the number one well so refrigeration though covers air conditioning too i think that's i think that's does it Yes. Oh, okay. We're talking about refrigeration in terms of yeah of air conditioning as well, and so that more and more people have access to cooling their homes. There's that that there's a drive there, and then as the danger is, as we heat up more and more. I mean, like I grew up in a house that didn't have air conditioning. Did you? We. I mean, I lived in the the Northeast. We had hot humid summers we had no air conditioners our our schools were not air conditioned it just we just weren't and now it's everything's gone to to being indoor when you're indoors you are making the static environment to keep that temperature always at 70 degrees or 68 degrees or whatever it is yeah it's interesting to me actually we do not have air conditioning even now in our mm -hmm. home mm -hmm. we do live in a northern climate Mind you, it gets up to, again, I'm thinking Celsius, uh, Fahrenheit uh, would be, you know, 90, high, high 80s, uh, low 90s, just mm -hmm. a couple of days every summer. And we just turn on our fans and open our yeah. windows. It cools off at night. But I mean, it's, but the closer you get to the equator, the harder it is to do that. And heat does kill people. So, yeah. And what is, and, there's some country that they're starting to air condition outdoors. What? Yes. I what? Want to say, I want to say it's like some place in India. Yeah, I'm going to have to look it up because now I'm really curious. But Okay, that's crazy. We've turned on the furnace outdoors, so let's counter it. With outdoor air conditioning. So while uh, you're looking up that place, I want to read the paragraph that is the introduction to the chapter on energy in Project Drawdown. How does that sound? Okay, hold on just a second, because here it is. Facing unbearable heat, Qatar has begun to air condition the outdoors. Of course, Qatar. They do yep. everything in excess there, I think. It was 116 degrees Fahrenheit in the shade outside the new Al Janoub soccer stadium and the air felt to air conditioning expert Saad Ghani as if God had pointed a giant hair dryer at Qatar. Yet inside the open air stadium, a cool breeze was blowing. Open air stadium. Yeah. Wow. Beneath, beneath each of the 40,000 seats, small grates adorned with Ara Arabic style patterns were pushing out cool air at ankle level. And since cool air sinks, waves of it rolled gently down to the grassy playing field. Vents the size of soccer fields fed more cold air onto the field. 
Okay. Yep. Well, there you have it. Well, that's going to be not sustainable, if I had to guess. No, but and as things heat up, like you said, as things heat up, we're going to, you know, we're, we're, more and more people are going to want to cool down. And yeah, so that's the refrigeration thing is kind of crazy. So they'll all be coming up to Red Lake, Ontario, I'm thinking. <laughs> I told you, client. We talked about it. The climate That's trail. Right. We're, all, we're all coming to Canada. <laughs> okay, this paragraph from Project Drawdown says uh, starts off. This section highlights the technologies and strategies supplanting energy production from fossil fuels. What were once fools' errands in the energy business, particularly wind and solar have relentlessly defied predictions and are now competitive with coal, gas, and oil. Renewable costs are continuing to fall on a year-to-year -year basis, while oil, gas, and coal from new sources are significantly more difficult to extract, which will cause carbon-based fuels to rise in cost. Canada, Finland, and four other countries have banned coal. Hmm, actually, I don't think that uh, that's true. Ontario has, but Canada as a country has not because it's still being burned in Saskatchewan. But all right, project drawdown. Need to edit that out. <laughs> Parts of Canada, Finland, and four other countries have banned coal and more are preparing to. Political leadership is a wonderful thing, but its absence does not slow the renewable transition. The United States pulled out of the Kyoto Protocol in 2001, and that act had virtually no impact on the growth of the renewable energy industry. If you spend a year immersed in the economic data about energy, as we did, there is only one plausible conclusion. We are, in writer Jeremy Leggett's words, squarely in the middle of the greatest energy transition in history. The era of fossil fuels is over, and the only question now is when the new era will be fully upon us. Economics makes its arrival inevitable. Clean energy is less expensive. So there you go. In looking and doing the research for this, you know, I was reading um, the, the chapter, the two-page chapter in Drawdown about solar farms, and, in the, and it said in the 1950s, um, Photo photovoltaics were so expensive that it that it cost more than nineteen hundred dollars per watt in today's wow. dollars. Wow! And now it's dropped. So if sent from the nineteen fifties, it's dropped all the way down to sixty five cents per watt today. So economically, and it's going to continue to drop because more more supply and demand. How that makes things drop we're finding more and more technologies to make things easier uh, yeah. and cheaper and cheaper. And now it takes like a year's time to set up a solar farm versus how long does it take to set up a coal plant or how mm -hmm. long does it take to set up some kind of extraction? So the economics of it are there. Even with the subsidies, because the fossil fuel subsidies across the globe are still in the billions every frigging year <laughs> yeah yeah oh, heavy sigh that's yes. our tax dollars at work yeah um what was i reading about today about the fossil fuel hmm what the subsidies were mm, i don't know if it was there but yeah it's it's incredible we'll we'll put it in it's billions billions in the u.s in canada and they're so inefficient. The International Monetary Fund estimates that the fossil fuel industry received more than $5.3 trillion in direct and indirect subsidies in 2015. That's $10 million a minute, wow. or 6.5% 6, 6 of the global GDP. In comparison, the U.S. wind energy industry, so this is just in the wind mm -hmm. in the U.S., has received 12.3 billion in direct subsidies since 2000. So yeah, it's, it's craziness. So it, it makes it like people are like, well, how, you know, how can we move away from 
gas and, and oil and if you were paying the true cost of it, and that doesn't even bring in the costs of to miners' lungs and to air pollution and all, it doesn't bring in any of that. And climate change. And climate change, of course, and yes. climate change. So yeah. Um, and the thing is, we are paying for it. We are paying, if, if that's divided per taxpayer in Canada, so I think it's $800 per Canadian every year, goes right mm -hmm. into. Imagine, imagine people don't want to pay a carbon price, which which could would be maybe one hundred and fifty dollars, maybe two hundred dollars a year. It's all it's all how the numbers are spun. I mean, if, it's very similar to what's happening here in the states when people say, "Well, Medicare for all." Well, they you know, well, what's going to happen to our tax base? You are already paying so much a month for your medical insurance, and then your deductibles, yes. and yada yada yada. So you know, it's ridiculous how much how expensive medical is here or healthcare is here in the States, but people don't want to look at it and say, well, I'm going to pay more in taxes, but you're going to be paying less. <laughs> <and> what... Hello. <laughs> well, you do, you can't, you don't have to convince me as a Canadian that uh, Medicare for all is, is the way to go. Not a perfect system, but wow. So much better than the alternative. All right. Now I have to ask you, Rose, what do you do for your healthcare? Cause you're oh, not working. Um, I have Obamacare. Oh. Because, um, yeah. I, I live in the state, the great state of Massachusetts, which is, um, which was Mitt, Mitt Romney when he was the governor. He uh, instituted uh, an incredible um, healthcare directive here in Massachusetts. And they tried to use it uh, to set up, set it up as, what should be used across the United States and that didn't, that really didn't work, but yeah. Well, go, go Mitt, Republican Mitt. We, yeah, we, get we digress, but mm -hmm. so now if you're, you were looking at solar, so uh, remind our listeners where on the list, uh, project drawdown list is solar. Okay. So solar farms is number eight. Okay. Um, as a solution and solar rooftop solar is number 10. So they have it mm. broken down. Okay. What are, are solar farms? So I know what rooftop solar is because we have an array on our roof. Um, so do I. Yep. So do I. So uh, we know what that is. What solar farms? Is that when like, it's just a field full of solar arrays or is it they there's also this way of um using solar panels to melt some kind of metal so there are these panels that are set up side by side that that um make a huge energy harvesting farm and so they probably go right into the grid i'm thinking i think so i don't understand exactly how solar works i mean i i I kind of get it. Um, I don't understand the technology of it all that much, but it, well, it, just I, make, it just makes sense. I mean, it, the sun shines every day. It's virtually unlimited. It's clean. It's free. It's uh, at a price that never changes. It's like, although I guess it doesn't shine every day. It's been cloudy here lately. I have been finding it's cloudier here than it used to be in the winter. We had used to be much more sunny, I think. Mm. But FYI, concentrated solar which is what I was in a not very articulate way trying to describe is number 25. Oh, yes, sorry. actually. So it says in the past decade is it, it has become relatively standard to build these concentrated solar plants with storage in the form of molten salt tanks. Concentrated solar. So that is. Yes. So, so that. Me, so speak to that. Okay. It basically, uh, a concentrated solar power rely on, okay, I might be reading here, <laughs> immense amounts of direct sunshine, and they basically focus it, and um, the difference is rather than using coal or natural gas, CSP uses solar radiation as its primary fuel, free and clear of carbon. Mirrors, the essential component of any CSP plant, that's concentrated solar plant, are curved or angled in specific ways to concentrate 
incoming solar rays to heat a fluid, produce steam, and turn turbines. Okay, that's interesting. Yes. Warmed with excess heat during the day, molten salt can be kept hot for five or ten hours, depending on the particular site, and then used to generate electricity when the sun's rays soften. The capacity is crucial for the hours when people remain awake, but the sun has gone down. Because we use most of our energy after the, yeah, after the sun goes down, of course, everybody has to have their lights on and that's when right. people come home and cook and do all that kind of stuff. So energy consumption, I think between the hours of like five and nine is the highest. Oh, interesting. Well, I know here in Ontario, we have time of use pricing and they make it more expensive between, I think it's 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Mm -hmm. for household use, because that's when industrial use is, is high. Mm -hmm. And so what they want is by pricing it higher, they want to shift like people doing their wash and putting their dishwashers on and sort of home use into the evening or at night. So we're just used to doing our laundry after 7 p.m. or on the weekends because it's just considerably cheaper. No, oh, that's kind of the old phone company model where you, you know, it was cheaper to call at night or on the mm. weekends than it was during the week. And I think it was the same thing because during the week, during workday hours, that was kind of more com for commercial use. But if you called at night or on the weekends, and I always lived in a time time zone that was different from people. So I, I could, they could call me after 11, but I couldn't, if I called them after 11, it was like two o'clock in the morning. I'm just like, so bizarre. Well, yes. it's actually fairly standard in Europe to have time of use pricing. Hmm. Okay. I don't know if it's common in other provinces in Canada, but that's how we run in Ontario. So it says for this California um, governor government page, currently all commercial industrial and agricultural customers in and California are required to be on time of use plan, but residential customers can choose to be on time of use plans by contacting their utility. So I wonder I if you, yeah, get a discount. Who knows? It's complicated. Mm -hmm. Like, like all of it, but you know, but it's not like we can't figure it out. And that's what I like about the drawdown book is that all these people got together and like said, okay, these are the, these are the things that exist right now that we can use, but we need to get them to scale right right so we haven't talked about wind at all yeah wind um number two wind, on onshore yeah onshore is number two and offshore is 22 yeah there's there's a huge offshore wind farm being built in um between massachusetts and rhode island it's been very controversial mm -hmm. because um, like everything else, you know, not in my backyard kind of thing. Um, the, the hoi polloi on Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket didn't want it to ruin their, um, their views. And so, um, there's, was lobbying and all this kind of stuff done and a number of companies have tried it and then gone down and, but now it looks like it's actually going to happen. So, well, um, I could tell you a sad story of what happened to a wind turbine project that was, was already being built in Ontario and our very re regressive conservative government canceled it. And I'm doing this air quotes because it might harm bats and uh, they're going to end up being sued. They being the people of Ontario, I'm sure because it was so far. They actually had to take down turbines that they had put up. It was- uh, Oh, they, they had to do that in, in the town of Falmouth where I live. Oh, I remember, right. Yep, yep, they, yeah. So, a pox, a pox on <laughs> them. That's what I say, because it's gonna, it's the same thing in, in Ontario, our current government is taking the federal government to court spending our taxpayer dollars, suing them the feds for putting a price on carbon and they're spending our taxpayer dollars. So there you go. Subsidies, stupid lawsuits, opposing progressive uh, climate change policies and taking down wind farms. This is happening in 2020 in Ontario. Well, it's so, 
so getting back to you know this this chapter on wind turbines in the drawdown book um i didn't realize that lego had gotten into the energy that was interesting yeah and they have built this huge um off the coast of liverpool england um 32 offshore wind turbines each double the height of the statue of liberty wow and each turbine generates eight megawatts of electricity. And so they were all together. The power, the project will power, um, will supply power for all 466,000 inhabitants of Liverpool. Wow. So yeah. And then Spain actually has um, 10 million homes in Spain are powered by wind alone. So, I mean, it's, it is happening. We're moving in that direction. Um, can we move fast enough? Mm -hmm. And it has to be a combination. You know, I, I saw a tweet uh, today by somebody in the oil and gas industry in Alberta, basically saying it's cold in Alberta and the sun doesn't shine all the time. So we obviously can't use solar power very much of our year here. And um, so it's changing this mentality that says, oh, it's really hard. No, it, it's not easy because we haven't done it before in this scale, but it's, it's doable. And like the point that you made, it's getting so much cheaper. In fact, cheaper and easier than fossil fuels and nuclear and so mm -hmm. and it's 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 all of the above if you don't have yes the sun doesn't shine all the time so there's wind and there's geothermal and there's tidal depending on where you are if you're on the coast mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and people are working on these options so that's that's the good news luckily it's not just up to you and me rose Although we do have our rooftop solars, we're doing our bit. Yep, we are. Well, yep, we are. L little bit by little bit. And I think we need to all be doing our little bit. So let's, so that's the good segue into the good news for this week. Yes. What? And there was a lot of good news <gasps> this week, right? Yes. There so, was. Um, so uh, two days ago, The Guardian, who for anybody who doesn't rely on mainstream media, The Guardian is, is someone that I turn to all the time to kind of get uh, really what's happening without as much spin. Um, they became the first major newspaper in the world to ban advertisements from fossil fuel companies. And I'm old enough to remember when that happened with the tobacco industry, and that changed a lot of people's perception about what was going on. It's delegitimizing the right. industry. And so that comes to, I can't remember his name, Jim... Jim Cramer, woohoo! CNBC's Jim Cramer said on Friday that he is done with fossil fuel stocks because young investors' concerns about climate change make them unattractive. And he's mad money, Jim yeah. Cramer. I mean, he's, he's a whack job if you watch him, but he's got a huge following. And I think that's mainstream. Yep, that's, that's what we're talking about is making. Uh, making the message uh yeah making the message out there and and the more people that hear that message and pull their money the quicker it can happen da, um goldman yeah goldman Sachs, um, downgraded exxon to, to sell. sell yeah yeah big go big doings big big doings and the uh, other article, the finance industry groggily awakens to climate change. So that, that is worth celebrating. Big things are, are uh, happening. And I'm going to combine the action step and the sanity tip again. Okay. This week. Making it easier on our listeners to only yes. have to do one thing to stay yes. sane. You are, are, and take action. You are welcome. So there is an online summit that's happening February 1st to the 10th, put on by Global Eco Village Network. And uh, it is communities for 
Future Online Summit, Our Response to the Climate Emergency. And they have three speakers every day. By the time we post this, it, it'll be half over. But if you listen to it right away, which, of course, you should as soon as our podcast <laughs> comes out, uh, you'll still be able to catch the last half. Um, and again, with three speakers every day, there's uh, lots of information. And I've just been c- getting caught up on it today, listening to John Liu and really thoughtful and thought provoking. And uh, so th- there's good news there. They're, they're also taking it very seriously. So, um, but your action step is to listen to as many speakers as you can manage from the summit and hopefully the discussion will will also encourage you because there's a lot being done all over the world well and my favorite guy um, Mm -hmm. charles Charles eisenstein is is on there i think he was the first day actually was he and thomas hubble yes um, who i think he's pretty interesting john lou um yeah there's there's the whole christiana figueres from She was the UN climate ambassador for a number Mm -hmm. of years. So that's a wrap. That's this week's episode of Earth Feels. Special thanks to singer-songwriter Kristen Hoffman for generously allowing us to use song for the ocean. Thanks for listening. Don't forget, subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss an episode. Catch you next time. Bye-bye. Children of the earth, I'm calling out. There's a mission for you and for me You see, your mother, she has been suffering And the truth is told beneath the sea